Well, good morning and welcome to Trinity Church uh, for our live stream worship service today from here in Bolton, Massachusetts. I'm Pastor David Smith, and today's the first Sunday of Lent. And so uh, I'm going to pray as we get ready. Make sure you have your worship guides ready to go so you can participate in worship at home. And make sure you've got a Bible ready so you can look up the scriptures and get ready to sing. Don't just watch, but participate. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this worship service to, together. And thank you that we can meet here uh, in this way to, to worship you in spirit and in truth. Bless each home, uh, each family, each individual uh, that are gathered around their computers and their, and their uh, devices uh, to be able to worship you. Come down, Holy Spirit, upon us and uh, quicken our hearts. Help us to uh, knit our hearts together as, as one community. And we thank you, Father, for the privilege of calling you Father and for your grace that makes it all possible. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, Tim and Frank are here today to lead us in our music. Good morning, everyone. Let's start by reading our call to worship together. Stand with me, if you would, wherever you are. You are my hope, O Lord. I will praise you continually. O God, be not far from me. O God, make haste to help me. I will hope continually. I will praise you yet more and more. My lips will rejoice when I sing to you. You have redeemed my soul. It will rejoice when I sing to you. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, all that is within me, bless his name. He forgives all our sin. He is slow to anger, full of grace. As high as the heavens are up above, so is the greatness of his love. As far as the east is from the west, he removes our sin from us. Far as the east is from the west, far as the east is from the west. Days from dust to dust we fade, but his love will remain. Merciful to those who fear his name, as high as the heavens are up above, so is the greatness of his love. As far as the east is from the west, he removes our sin from us. Far as the east is from The steadfast love of the Lord From everlasting to everlasting Oh, the steadfast love of the Lord From everlasting to everlasting Yes, the steadfast love of his love as far as the east is from the west he removes our sin from us far as the east is from the west far as the east is from the west far as the east is from the west
Out of the depths I cry to Thee Oh Lord, please hear my call Oh Lord, be merciful to me At Thy throne of grace I fall God, we come before you today, it's, as Pastor David mentioned, the first Sunday of Lent, this time of penitence, of fasting, of, of recognizing 
our need for your mercy, for your love. But we thank you that even on the, the tale of Ash Wednesday, we remember that you are the God who lifts us up from the dust, who raises us out. And the reason why that happens is because of your steadfast love for us that's never ending. We pray that you'd be reminding us of that this morning, that you would draw us towards your forgiveness this day and all days. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Tim and Frank, and thank you for, for singing along. Uh, before we pray, I've got some uh, exciting news. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, many of you for filling out the, uh, the worship survey. We've got some really cool pie charts here with colors that, and, and bar graphs, and I don't know if that excites you, but it, excites me, it really excites me to have all this data of, of just people giving us feedback about about worship services and going forward. Uh, and after much prayer and getting all the facts and, and going on, uh, the elders and I and, and Pastor Eric decided yesterday that we're going to uh, begin opening up the services uh, at 1030 uh, in two weeks, starting March the 7th. And so we have about 31 people that said, we're ready now. The bulk, the majority of our congregation is not ready now. And I want you to know that's great. That's fine. We don't want to push anyone. We want everyone to feel comfortable and come at a place when they're ready to worship God and they feel safe. So we're going to continue with a live stream. In fact, one person said, after everything's back to normal, I'm still going to stay home and live stream the service. And that's good news for you. Uh, that, that one person, we're going to continue it, all right? And so uh, look in your, in your email for a letter this week from the elders that will give more specifics about the 1030 service. We'll go from 1030 to 1130. We'll keep it to an hour. We'll work hard on that. And uh, also uh, our Sunday school will be Zooming, continuing to Zoom, and they'll shift from 9 to 10 uh, in two weeks and then it gives you half an hour to come with your, your family, your children, to the 1030 service if you like. We'll continue doing the 8 o'clock. So check your email for more details. Uh, that's, that's the latest. Well, let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly and Holy Father, we're so grateful uh, for uh, the privilege of calling you Father. We thank you for the shed blood of Jesus Christ, his death upon the cross that makes that relationship with a thrice holy God possible. We thank you for filling us with your Holy Spirit, indwelling us as we ask Jesus to come into our hearts by faith. And we thank you, Lord, for that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. That wherever we worship, whether we worship at home or uh, in our cars or outside or in a, in a building, a sanctuary like this, that we are to worship you in spirit and in truth. And the place to worship you is wherever we are. And we pray that we would worship you this morning and uh, throughout this week, uh, calling upon you as our loving Heavenly Father. As we think of this season of Lent and this 40 days of preparation for uh, Holy Week and, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we think Jesus how you spent 40 days in the wilderness, fasting and praying, a time of denial, a time of getting ready to, to do the Father's will. And during that time, you were tempted of the devil three times and how you defeated the devil and overcame him by the power of your authority and by standing upon the authority of the word of God, Scripture. God's word says this, and Lord, we pray you'd help us to be overcomers, overcome uh, Satan's attacks in our lives and overcome our, our afflictions, our, our trials that we face, uh, being men and women of faith, and that we would know that in this world we will suffer much tribulation, much trouble, but we can be of good cheer for you have overcome the world. And we thank you, Lord, for, uh, for helping us to overcome all that we face in this life. Lord, we pray that you'd give us a, 
a joyful heart today for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We pray that we would uh, be mindful of those around the world that are suffering and to pray for them. We think of the people in Texas. Lord, to imagine to, uh, to not have electricity, not have heat, have broken, broken pipes and frozen pipes and uh, ruined homes and uh, no food in the refrigerator, not even a refrigerator to, uh, that, that's operating. Uh, it, it's hard to imagine. And we pray for these millions of people in Texas and surrounding um, states that are in this incredible emergency uh, with no food, many of them, and, and no warm place to stay. We thank you for the forecast of warmer days coming up on Monday and Tuesday, but we pray for the ongoing need for drinking water and for housing and for you to raise up people that will come and care for those in their time of great affliction. Father, we do pray for our Sunday school. We thank you for our teachers and for the faithful uh, Zooming that they do uh, to, to really continue to teach the Word of God to our children and do it in a safe manner. Uh, we pray, Father, for all the steps ahead as we continue to seek to communicate and share the love of Christ to one another. Lord, we're all feeling a bit lost. We're all feeling disconnected. And we're, we're thankful for this, this way of reaching out by live stream and for our tech committee that makes it possible. Lord, help us to connect not only Sunday morning in this way, but throughout the week uh, to think how we can connect with someone by uh, calling them or texting them or sending them an email or FaceTime or, or whatever means that we can think of uh, stopping by outside and dropping a little gift off at their house. Lord, whatever it is, help us to uh, not socially distance, but physically distance and remain socially involved in the lives of others. Father, we thank you uh, for your grace and we pray for those that are sick and those in hospital those going through times of grief and sorrow. Lord, I think of the statistic I heard uh, in the news yesterday about this funeral director in Texas that 90% of his funerals are COVID deaths. I can't imagine his business has tripled. Uh, Lord, uh, we want all businesses to, to, to do well, but I can't imagine having tripled uh, the number of people to care for. So we pray for funeral directors that are exhausted, Lord, in the work that they're doing, and we pray you would help them as they seek to bring comfort uh, uh, to those in great sorrow. Father, thank you for hearing our prayer, and thank you for your, your sovereign grace. Hear us, Lord, as we sing together the Lord's Prayer. <laughs>
encourage you to, to give as the Lord has blessed you, you and your own household uh, to give uh, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over uh, to, to the ministry here of Trinity Church that we can continue and grow to bring the gospel uh, across the street and across uh, the commonwealth and around the, the world. So thank you for your giving. Uh, we appreciate very, very much. Well, now Samantha Gray has some special music called Another in the Fire, and we're going to, she's recorded this as, as a video, and we think of the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and there's one who appears in the fire, and uh, that, listen for that person in this song. So, Samantha? This is a song called Another in the Fire, and I hope that the lyrics are relatable in that um, they kind of take us on a journey from looking at our past and seeing that God was actually in that difficult situation and that maybe he was preventing something from happening and that we can see him now and that we'll be able to see this in the future as well. And I pray that this will encourage that person who really needs to see God right now. There's a place when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in When I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me There was another in the waters Holy magnesies And should I ever need reminding What power set me free There is a cross that bears the burden Where another died for me There was another in the fire Thank you. 
Old Testament reading, turn with me to Psalms 51, verses 1 through 13. This is a Psalm of David from when the prophet Nathan came to him after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to thy great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sins. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressor, transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. For our New Testament, uh, for our gospel reading, turn with me to Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 34. Simon, Simon, Satan had asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fa fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times that you know me. Next, Matthew chapter 26, 69 through 75. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said, but he denied it before them all. I do not know what you are talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway, and where another girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again, and with an oath, I do not know the man. After a little while, those standing by there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. New Testament reading is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 through 4, 15. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the true truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of the darkness, 
made his light in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despair, in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around our body of death of, G of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our bodies. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the, his life may also be revealed in our mortal bodies. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from death will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself, as this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his holy and inspired word. Well, thank you, Tom, and thank you for uh, listening in and reading God's word together with your family. Well, let's pray as we get started for today's message. Father, thank you for the word of God, and we pray that, Holy Spirit, you'd open our minds and our hearts to your truth that will transform us, and we pray that you would teach us new things and that we would put into practice old things that we know, and we give you all the glory and honor for your, uh, your sanctifying and saving grace. In your name we pray, amen. Well, we are in a series, a topical series on leadership. And hopefully it's been a blessing for you so far. It's been a blessing and a challenge uh, to me in preparing this and uh, delivering them. Today is our eighth message, and we have ten messages, so we just have two more to go after this. And today's message is entitled, Finding Rest Restorative Grace for the Fallen Leader. When it comes to failure in leadership, there are no shortage of examples to choose from in a leader's life. And certainly in the days uh, looking at current events, and we think of situation of evangelical leaders that have fallen, uh, even though they have, some of them have died uh, and their transgressions are coming to light, we can all relate. Why is it that there is no shortage of examples to choose from of leaders that have fallen? Well, Paul puts it this way in the second letter to the church at Corinth in chapter 4. We are all jars of clay and cracked jars at that, 2 Corinthians 4. In those jars of clay, we have been given the treasures of God's grace and his mercy in Jesus Christ. We're called to let the light of the gospel of his grace shine forth out of the darkness in our lives to show the world that the all-surpassing power of God's grace is from him. Not from us, not from our own doing, it's from him. Leaders are far from perfect. We all fail and sin against the Lord and against one another. The point is not that it's no big deal. The fact it is sin is always a big deal, particularly in the life of the leader. Uh, because the leader is called to be an example, example to us all. Uh, the question being, when a leader fails, how do we fail forward? Or how do we spiritually rebound from the failure, particular when it's moral failure in the life of a leader? In other words, what is the pathway forward of restorative grace for a fallen leader? Now, as we begin this topic, there are many examples in the Bible as well of people that were called by God to lead that failed. I'm glad that the Bible doesn't sort of look at history through rose-colored glasses and cut out 
all, all the, the mistakes there. Otherwise, I would feel like I can't relate to this person. They live this perfect life. For example, there's Abraham. He lies about his wife to Abim, Abim, Abimelech, saying that she's not my wife, she's my sister in Genesis 20. He acts out of fear. He didn't want to be killed for his beautiful wife, and so he lies. Then there's Jonah. Jonah, he disobeys God when God says, Jonah, go to Nineveh and preach. I call them to repent. He said, I don't want to do that. I mean, what if they do? <laughs> I offer them grace, and I don't want to give them grace. I want to basically see, thinking of them more punitively. Uh, so he goes the other way, and God uh, God brings the storm. You probably know the story, and the sailors throw him overboard. A big fish swallows him up, and he prays in the belly of this fish, and, and it brings him along the shore and, and spits him up there in the Mediterranean, and on he goes to Nineveh, and he preaches, and guess what? They repent. <laughs> they receive God's grace, and, and then he, he's angry about it. Sometimes we get angry when people are forgiven or shown grace. We don't want them to experience grace. And here we see what Jonah has. Well, then there's David's sin of adultery with Bathsheba and murder and the cover-up against Uriah the Hittite. That comes to mind and, and comes to failure of the disciples. Uh, there's many examples there. We think about this boy that had a demon and the, and the disciples could not cast it out uh, because they're... they're uh, he said, this kind comes out through prayer and fasting. And, uh, and then there's this sin of pride and jealousy of the disciples, arguing on who's the greatest. And James and John, uh, demanding of Jesus, call down fire upon those Samaritans and, and, and torch them. It doesn't really show great grace, does it? You know, it's like, I, I want to see them that. Uh, and what does Jesus do? He shows grace to the woman at the well, the Samaritan, and forgiveness to her the sinned as well. Well, each of those failures in the life of a leader bears special study and consideration. But the, the failure of a leader that Jesus predicted twice on two separate occasions, which came to pass exactly as Jesus foretold, is the three denials of Peter, denying that he knew Jesus Christ. All are recorded in, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Imagine now your failures recorded in Holy Scripture for everyone to read forever and ever and have it repeated four times. In case you missed it the first time, you can read about it another time. Now, why is that? I think many of us are drawn to the Apostle Peter not because he lived a flawless life, but because of his failures. And how he responded to those times of failure in failing forward, going through brokenness and repentance to a place of final restoration as a leader for Jesus Christ. Christ's response to Peter's failures show us that the gospel of Jesus Christ is a gospel of grace, of cleansing, of restoration for the fallen. Jesus is with his disciples in the upper room. He has just washed their feet. He's instituted communion. When Jesus says these words of prophecy and prediction, Luke 22, 31. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, Strengthen your brothers. But Peter replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Now notice here in this first prediction of Peter's denial, Jesus says, Satan has asked permission to sift Peter like wheat. But Jesus prayed for him that his faith would not fail. Once he turned, Jesus instructs Peter to strengthen his brothers. So you see, God is a sovereign God. Before Satan can attack you, he has to get permission before he does these things. We see it in the case of Job and the case of Peter and so forth. And so Jesus not only foresaw Peter's triple failure, but his spiritual rise to faith 
and his ministry of strengthening the faltering faith of the other disciples. So here's the first leadership principle for today. Satan wants to ruin your leadership and get you to renounce your faith in Christ. That's important to realize that's the objective. Therefore, we can prepare for it and we can get ready. Satan wants to take you out of the gospel ministry. He wants to not just sideline your leadership, but to discredit your Christian testimony, cause you and those that you lead to renounce the faith in Jesus Christ. We see it too often in the news, don't we? High-profile evangelical leader whose ministry has blessed millions is charged with sexual misconduct or with drug or alcohol abuse, and the fallout affects not only the victims and their families, but all those associated with his ministry and leadership or in support of that ministry. As a leader, you will face opposition to your work as a leader. That goes without saying. That goes with the territory. But when it comes to the gospel ministry, that opposition comes from the devil who prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking to bring you down, discredit your ministry, devour your faith in the faith of others. Now, Peter says this from a voice of experience and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, 1 Peter chapter 5. He says, be alert, sober mind. Your enemy prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, and you can. Stand firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Well, Peter goes on in verse 10 in that verse and says, And the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you've suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. He knows personally what restoration feels like. And so the voice of experience and the voice of the Holy Spirit says, God, by his grace, will restore you. He's that kind of God. Well, Satan will seek to devour our ministry of leadership. And he'll use whatever means he can get his, his, his paws on to get you to commit moral failure, to shrink back from the gospel work. And, and he's called you to fulfill that work. Well, Jesus already saw the failure that was looming on the horizon for Peter. Peter would not go to prison for Jesus as he claimed, nor would he die for Jesus as he boldly promised. Instead, Jesus would die for Peter. Don't, don't miss that point. Jesus said, you're not going to die for me, but I will die for you. And when I think of all of my failures, and there's many, I think of Jesus knowing all of that, went to the cross for me, and he went to the cross for you, for your sins, to die for you. He's a God of grace and of mercy. Peter would deny even knowing Jesus, not only once, but three times over, first before a lowly slave girl, and then before two others that very night. Jesus was already looking past the failure to restore Peter as a leader by his grace. And so we come to the second leadership principle. We'll put that up on your screen. God's all-sufficient grace is available to the fallen leader to be restored to Christ, to be given a second opportunity to serve Christ again. There's something powerfully redemptive in the ministry of the gospel when God forgives and restores a fallen leader to the ministry by his all-sufficient grace. Paul addresses this grace in Romans 5.20. Romans 5.20. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? So where sin increases, grace increases all the more. 
God's grace is greater than all our sin. Does that mean that we should go ahead and and traffic in sin to kind of magnify the grace of God? God forbid. We don't showcase His grace by that because as Christians, we've died to sin. We're under new management, under the Lordship of Christ. And therefore, we no longer live as we once lived and we have to flee sins of sexual immorality. We have to flee these, these other kinds of sins. You see, when it comes to restoring fallen leaders, there's, uh, there's generally several typical responses done by Christians. And maybe you can see yourself in one of these responses, all right? Paul David Tripp says in his book simply entitled Lead, one way a leadership community in their inability to believe what has been revealed about a leader, they thought they knew and could trust rises almost immediately to the leader's defense. They minimize or outright discount what has been revealed, while they claim to know this leader and assure that he would never do what he is charged with doing. They proclaim their loyalty to the leader under charge and question the validity of the charges and the motives of those that have come forward with this information. That is one response. And some of you are are thinking about uh, Ravi Zacharias and the situation there, and certainly some people responding in in this particular way. Well, then we find a second way. Paul David Tripp says this in the book Lead. The second way a leadership community may respond in their shock or what has happened as they feel deceived and duped as their compassion for the one caught in sin is replaced with anger. The responses are are more punitive than pastoral. They soon break relationship with the leader, concerned now more with the legalities in the matter, and rush to negotiate some kind of severance package and move on. Sometimes that is the response, you see. Well, now now there are times for sure when a leadership community must separate from a fallen and recalcitrant leader. But the goal must always be to work towards biblical restoration, but to take no shortcuts, nor which fail to look to the Lord's path of discipline and redemptive and restorative grace, perhaps not to the same place of leadership and responsibility where the moral failure took place, but maybe some other kind of service that a person is to do. If a person is a senior pastor, for example, and they they sin greatly, Probably they should not be restored to that same position. But these are matters for careful consideration before God. Now, what God requires of us when we fail in our leadership assignments is not denial or cover-up. We're good at that. Or blaming others. Or even blaming the devil. Well, the the devil's responsible, all right? The devil made me do it. No, but confession of sin brokenness before God and before others, repentance before God. David, when he sinned against God and the nation of Israel, he was called to lead with the sin of adultery, at first hid his sin. He denied it. He covered it up. But God in his grace sent Nathan the prophet to confront him head on. And he he did this through this wonderful story. And you can read about it in scripture. Well, David was, because David was a man after God's own heart, he responded with brokenness and repentance, saying this, Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. I know my transgressions. My sin is always before me, Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you're right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Well, there's a great example of true repentance from sin. And returning to our example in the life of Peter, we move to Matthew 26, 69, in which we read how a servant girl says that he was, Peter was with Jesus of Galilee, to which he denies it before her with others listening. Then a a, a second servant girl said, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denies it with an oath, even stronger denial. Then a third group of people said, 
surely you're one of his followers because your accent gives you away. Now, I don't know what the accent was being up north in Galilee. Some of you may think, well, you know, maybe up north. Well, we might think of an accent up in Maine or something like that. Well, people down south think about our accent up here in New England, wherever the case you may be. That, that accent up north, we can tell you're not from around here, they said. Your accent gives you away. Well, then we read these verses of Scripture in Acts, uh, Matthew 26, verse 74, and that'll appear on your screen as well. Then Peter began to call down curses. He swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you'll disown me three times. He went outside and wept bitterly. Luke's gospel narrative adds this in uh, Luke twenty two sixty one, And the Lord turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembered the words of the Lord, how he told him before rooster crows, today you'll deny me three times. And so Peter wept bitterly over his failure in denying Christ. So here's our third leadership principle. So sit up and pay attention and maybe take note of this. Take responsibility for your failures in leadership and don't blame others for your failures. I'm sorry. I was wrong. Practice that, all right? I was wrong. Sometimes I do premarital counseling and uh, kind of uh, tongue-in-cheek, I, I say to the guy, uh, to the, the husband-to-be, I said, all right, I want you to practice this with me. I'm sorry, honey, I was wrong. He said, what? I've never said that before. You better start practicing. And then I'll say it to her too. Guess what? You're going to blow it too. Say, I'm sorry. I was wrong. Don't, don't blame others for your failures, for your mistakes. Accept responsibility for your action. Be accountable for your results. Take ownership for your mistakes. Stand up to the plate and say, I'm sorry the fault lies with me. I messed up. Well, human nature being what it is, some people are more prone to blame others uh, than take responsibility. Here's Here's a, a comic strip uh, called Dilbert. Now, maybe you're, you're probably more sanctified than I am. You don't read this kind of stuff, but I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. So here we go. Here, here, here's the, there's the picture of uh, Dilbert and his boss. And the boss said, I, speaking to Dilbert across the table, I'm moving to a shared leadership model. Each of you will take on one piece of the leadership role. Well, Dilbert says, well, what's my piece? Let's see, I have you down for something called blame. <laughs> All right? I'm going to blame you. I need someone around to point the finger at. Well, becoming the leader that God meant you to be includes not blaming others for your failures. Here's some examples from drivers who, who wrote these explanations for their auto accident. All right? I think some of these are pretty good. An invisible car came out of nowhere struck my car, and vanished. <laughs> All right, that was, that was that what happened? All right, what, what happened with this, this accident, uh, sir? Well, this telephone pole was approaching fast. I attempted to swerve out of its path when it struck my front end. It's the pole's fault, right? Or here's another one. I was just keeping up with the cars behind me. <laughs> well, I don't know if you're laughing or not, but maybe you use some of these. I don't know. But here's the final one, and my apology to any mother-in-laws listening in. <coughs> Person said, I pulled away at the side of the road, glancing at my mother-in-law, and headed over the embankment. It's like unbelievable. When the mistakes are more than simply human error, but sin or moral failure before God, not only was must we take ownership for what we have done, but confess our sins to God? And if, impo if possible, sin against someone else. Call upon God for cleansing for your sin. As 1 John clearly says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we've not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. 
ever thought about it that way? Did you? You make God out to be a liar? God says you sinned. Oh, no, I haven't sinned. We're making God out to be a liar? That's a pretty serious charge. Peter shows us the path forward after denied knowing Jesus three times. Peter, at this very moment, which must have been magnified in Peter's already unbearable sense of shame, so he departed Caiaphas' house and wept bitterly. Well, John MacArthur says in regard to this event, and I love this statement, we'll put that up on your screen. John MacArthur says, the true Peter is seen not in his denial, but in his repentance. May that be said about us. The true fill in your name is seen not in their, uh, in their failures, but in their admitting those failures and their sin and in their repentance. After Jesus' death and resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples at the Sea of Galilee, and there around a charcoal fire, Jesus asked Peter three times, Peter, do you love me? With each affirmation, Jesus was, was restoring Peter, giving him a new ministry assignment. He said, feed my lambs. Do you love me? Tend my sheep. Do you love me? Finally, feed my sheep. So here we see the richness of the Lord's divine grace in action in John 21, and you can read that for yourself. Well, Peter was reluctant to make unswerving devotion to Jesus, seen in the choice of the Greek words for love here. He chose not to use the word agape, showing unconditional committed love. Instead, he uses the word phileo and uses a brotherly love, something that was uh, something less than full commitment. It, it would suggest that before he boldly made this statement, I'll go to the, I'll, I'll die for you, Jesus. I won't let you die. And now he, he, he's dialed it back a little bit. And he said, well, I'm, I'm fond of you. I, I don't love you with that same kind of uh, agape love. But Jesus lovingly restores Peter, calls him, focusing in on the teaching and the preaching of the word of God to feed Christ's flock. As Jesus had prayed for Peter previously after Satan had asked to, uh, permission to sift him like wheat, now Peter was being restored to leadership, given the assignment to strengthen his disciples through his teaching and preaching ministry. The book of Acts of the Apostles, it records some of the sermons of Peter and his ministry not only to the Jews, but to the Gentiles, including Cornelius and his household. As church tradition holds, Peter, after several decades of faithful leadership, went on to suffer martyrdom under wicked Caesar Nero, 67, 68 AD, where he was crucified upside down because he refused to be crucified like his Lord. Peter was shown God's merciful grace in his life as a fallen leader, went on to teach and preach to the world the gospel of God's grace, his undeserved favor to all who will repent. And so he says these words in 1 Peter 4, and they have special weight when we think about where they came from, from the Holy Spirit, but through the vessel, the cracked pot, if you will, of this man, Peter. He says this, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others, here it is, as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So whatever it is that you do to serve, using your gifts, it's using that grace of God in its various forms, where it's hospitality, where it's teaching, where it's singing, whether it's serving, maybe it's wiping down the pews, whatever it is that we do, bringing a cup of cold water, caring for the refugees, uh, you know, whatever we do for the Lord Jesus Christ, we do it as faithful stewards of his grace. So when you fail God and fail others as a leader, own up to it. Take responsibility. And where needed, ask people for forgiveness. Confess your sins to God and repent. Turn away from your sin. 
and receive the pardon of his grace. There will be consequences for your sin. There always is. You may be removed from leadership. You, if you've done something, a criminal offense, you may go to prison, and you may need to do that. You may need to, you may lose your job. You may, uh, your marriage may break up. There's always consequences for our sin, aren't there? You may go through a time of discipline, but with repentance and final restoration, that's the path forward that God wants to bring you and me, to bring us to restoration, to a place of relationship with him and with others. It's difficult, it's painful, but when we get there, how wonderful it is. When you fail and others fail you, remember to love each other deeply. Be a cracked pot of clay through which God's grace shines forth the world of people in need of grace, of cleansing, in need of agape love. Let's pray. Heavenly and Holy Father, we thank you so much for uh, this message today about uh, restorative grace for the fallen leader. And Lord, each one of us can identify in different levels of what it means to fail. Not only fail in a human error or make the bad judgment, but to morally fail, to lie, to cheat, to commit sexual immorality, to steal, to covet, uh, to, to, to be filled with pride, uh, lose our temper, and on and on. And sometimes after it, it happens, the damage is deep, is deep. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to fall to our knees and say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Not blame others. Not say it's not my fault. My boss made me do it. Not say it's my fault. It's not my fault. My, my mother made me do it. But to take responsibility and say, I'm the one. The buck stops here. I have failed in this assignment. I have no excuse I can only say, I'm sorry for what I have done. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, give us that heart of grace for one another. And may we receive that grace that you have waiting for us if we will confess our sins. We will repent before you and show our true colors like Peter did. Not in our failures, but in our responding to those with repentance. In your name we pray. Amen. Before we sing, I just wanted to make sure that everyone knows that the um, Lenten edition of Worship at the Table is available for anyone who wants it, either in the foyer here. We have some hard copies with um, some craft kits and some other goodies, or you can also find it on our website. And um, if you're not familiar with that, it's a collection of weekly table liturgies along with some recipes and crafts for um, families with kids or individuals or families without kids. If that's something that you have not taken advantage of yet, I wanted to further direct your attention to um, the Worship at the Table and Trinity Daily Devotional for Lent. Um, if you've been wondering if Worship at the Table is something that you can participate in, this is our invitation for you to, to pull up a chair at the table. Um, this is perfect for someone worshiping alone or in their families. Um, each liturgy is a short prayer, scripture reading, um, a short song, and then sprinkled throughout the week too, we have, we have other ways for you to engage. We'll be posting some reflections written by different members of um, the congregation here at Trinity, as well as some artwork and craft ideas and music and things like that. So please, again, pick that up either at um, the Welcome Center here in the foyer, stop by any time during the week, or you can visit trinitybolton.org slash W-A-T-T to download a digital copy there. Let's sing together.
great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, feed me till. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Open now the crystal fountain, whence the
riches in the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable His judgments, how untraceable His paths. Who knows the mind of our God and who can bring counsel to joining us for worship. Uh, uh, we got a team of guys here, and it just was just great to gather here to worship. And, a, and I, I trust that your worship experience at home was a blessed one as well. Uh, today is 221 you know, We can do a lot of fun things with those numbers, and I think of 221. I think of two times that uh, Jesus prophesied, Peter, you will deny me. And two plus one is three, right? So three times he denied him. But think also about three times he asked, do you love me? Restored him. And Peter go on to write how many epistles? Two epistles. So a lot of numerology there for those of you that like the kind of thing. It kind of tickles me. But it also helps to, to remember God's message of his grace. His grace. So have an awesome day on this February the 21st. Remember, God loves you. He's a God of mercy and grace. And he calls us to love one another with that same grace. Uh, have an awesome day. And thanks for listening and worshiping. <laughs>